Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I am so glad to be with you all this morning. It's always just a grand privilege to come together with like-minded people on the Sabbath for the purpose, one purpose, to glorify the Lord and to bring praise and thanksgiving before His um, amazing presence. There's nothing like it. Last week, we... um, looked at the life of King Saul and the the problems that surrounded his life. He He was a man that had a great start and a horrible end. He started out, uh, God appointed him to be Israel's first king. He had everything that it took because God enabled him to uh, have a humble heart. He enabled him with power from on high. Holy Spirit power, um, everything that King Saul needed to do the job that God had called him to was given to him. Just like God gives us what we need for whatever that he's asked us to do. And for a while, King Saul was a wonderful king, obedient and loving and demonstrated a heart that had been turned and changed by the Lord. But what happened to King Saul? The Bible says that God changed and turned his heart. So how did he wind up lost? How did the Holy Spirit leave him? How did he wind up with demons at the end of his life? What happened? You and I need to see what happened because you and I can wind up in the same place. One of his big problems that can be you and I is that Saul quit listening to the Lord. He quit listening. The Holy Spirit is always speaking to us constantly. He is always telling us things every day. The reason that we sit in the morning and have time with God, the reason that we go before him in prayer is not just to give him all of our lists of things that God give me this and this. It is to hear from God. We go to God to hear from him. We go to the word so that God can speak to us. Do you know that this is the one thing that differentiates Christianity from any other religion? Is that our God speaks to us. It differentiates God from any other God who wants a relationship with his people. Christianity is the only religion on the planet. Obviously, it's the only true religion. But to people, their religion is their truth. Christianity is the only religion where God whispers to his people. Awesome. To know God and to be known by him. And so all of Saul's life, the Holy Spirit was trying to reach him. And God brought discipline into Saul's life when he disobeyed. And he said, your family's not going to carry on the kingship. The the right's going to be given to someone else. But God was so patient with King Saul. Let things go. Kept wanting for Saul to continue doing what is right and living a life that was right. And the more that God gave him, the farther away he became where he couldn't distinguish the voice in his own head and the Holy Spirit's voice. Now remember that King Saul was heard, God spoke to him through the prophet Samuel. And there are times that God has spoken through through prophets, but God is always wanting to communicate with us directly. And it is imperative that we know the difference between God's voice and man's voice and the voice in our own head. Because God doesn't speak to us right now audibly. The day is coming where we will hear from him audibly. But right now, he gives us strong impressions. When you have the impression to pick the phone up and call someone and and encourage someone and God put someone on your heart and that won't go away, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. When the Holy Spirit says, what you just said, that was rude. What you just thought, that's selfish. That's 
our God speaking to us saying, not good. And God is always trying to bring us to a place of humility. When we lose that, we lose ground. So I want to talk about images today. There are three me's and three you's. Wow. We just tripled here. Make room. There are three me's and three you's. The me way up here that I think I am. Nobody else sees that me but me. Woo, way up here. So great, wonderful. Then there's the me in the middle here that everybody else sees. I have nothing, you and I have no control about how other people see us. You know, depending on how we talk and how we behave, people see us in a certain way. And then there's the God, there's the me that only God sees, the me that, and the me and the you that actually has our feet planted on the ground, not the me that's floating way up here on a pedestal. So there's three me's. God is always speaking to the me down here, not the wonderful me that I think I am. God's not interested in that me. You and I have a problem with making an image of ourselves that is non-existent. It comes through pride. It's prideful, it's arrogant, it boasts. And if you don't know that that me is there, and if you've never experienced that me, then see me after church. <laughs> we need, we, this is going to require a separate time. Because if you are walking with the Lord, you know the me that's up here that God is saying, uh-uh, climb down from your lofty place. You're not all that great. Come back down here to earth so we can talk. King Saul went from humble. Can't believe you're asking me to do this kingship. To, I got this, Lord. He took all of the gifting and he took all of the experience and all of the victories that God gave him as his own. He forgot who was behind the victories. That's how it starts. God empowers you to do something. You feel really good about it, and you should. We serve an awesome God who allows us and uses us to do things for his kingdom. It's wonderful. I hear you guys telling me stuff about your experiences with God all the time. It's empowering, and it's wonderful. The problem is when all of a sudden... What, let me tell you what God did to, let me tell you what I did. Let me tell you what I accomplished. Then things start to go downhill, and that's what happened to King Saul. King Saul started being very confident in himself. Instead of being confident in the God who was empowering him to have these victories, he became confident in himself. And you know what happens when we become confident in ourselves? We become independent from God. We don't need him. We forget that we're dependents. God has a lot of write-offs. So if he had to fill out an IRS thing, how many dependents? Seven billion. But we forget that we are dependents and we want to be independent. Lord, I can do this. And before Saul knew, he had, he had crossed every line and defied God. And God said, enough. I gave you all this. I gave you a place. You have desecrated my name. You have profaned my name. So now you, I'm taking the kingship away from you. All this time, the Holy Spirit had been whispering to Saul, that's not okay. That's not okay. Don't do that. This is wrong. Stop that. Get on your knees. It's not okay. Go this way. Go th he refused until there was no more hearing the Holy Spirit. He only heard and did what he wanted to do, and he expected for God to be okay with that. See, that's the way of the carnal heart. We want God to bless our mess. We want to stay where we are. We want to tell God what to do. We want to define righteousness. I mean, isn't that what's going on just today in Christianity? God said the seventh day is the Sabbath, and Christianity said, um... We would like to honor your resurrection, so we're going to move it to Sunday.
And they're, you know, sheep are dumb. They follow. The majority of the world has followed the wrong thing. And Saul had an awesome start and a horrible end because he quit listening to the Holy Spirit. So we know that his life ended in spiritual death and he will not spend eternity with Jesus at the resurrection. There was another king about as arrogant as King Saul. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Let's look at his life this morning. One of, one of the things that these two kings have in common is there are many things. But one real interesting thing is that you remember when Samuel came looking for Saul and he, had, he was told to go and destroy every living thing, the Amalekites, and he decided to spare the king and spare the best of the best and bring them with him. And so Samuel is just disgusted and he is upset and he goes looking for Saul and it's where Saul, oh, he went over here to go build a monument to himself. He had gone to build a monument to himself. There's something about power and wanting to have monuments for ourselves, wanting to have these images, wanting to have these things that tell about our greatness. And it comes from the carnal heart. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen king. He did not know the God of heaven. And God decided that Nebuchadnezzar would be his servant to carry out a task of going and to bring Israel into captivity because Israel had rebelled and had sinned against God and had filled their cup of iniquity and God said, enough. So Nebuchadnezzar had gone, brought Israel into captivity and um, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a very strange dream. And it just bothered him when he woke up. He had this really weird, strange dream, but he couldn't remember what it was. Well, Daniel winds up coming into the court, and Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, can you tell me what my dream was? Because all of the other wise men had said, King, nobody can do that. If you tell us your dream, we can interpret it for you, but who can actually do that? So, Daniel, can you tell me what my dream was? And Daniel said, no, I can't, but the God of heaven can. God can tell you what your dream was and its interpretation. Well, in Daniel 2, we know that the, the, um, the vision was a vision of a metal man. And God was giving the history of the world from that point forward, which is awesome because those living at the, at the last, the end generation, would need to understand this to be able to make sense of the book of Revelation. So he tells them that, and he tells them that there are going to be other kingdoms. You're the head of gold. God has given you everything. You are right now. This kingdom that you have is the best that there's going to be. After this, each one will be inferior. So he listens to all of that, and he processes it. And then he thinks it's really, really neat. I go to Daniel 2, verse 46. He's so amazed that King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. He says, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Now I want you to note that bowing does not mean humility. Just because you bow does not mean that you are humbled. And those of you that know the story, he decided to change what God said. God said there are going to be other kingdoms. I'm not going to accept that. I am the head of gold. I am wonderful. I am going to build a big monument, a big image. He goes out to the plain of Dura, no telling how long it took, but a 90-foot tall golden statue. Then he sent message to everyone who was anyone all around the kingdom. Everyone is to show up and come to worship this image. And so they came. 
Everyone who was anyone, every official, every leader, anyone, they were all summoned. When you hear the music, you are to bow down to this image. See, the carnal nature won't bow. It wants others to bow to it. It's this me that's way up here. We're up floating. We can see people below us. We're, we're grand. They're not. We all have the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome, every one of us. If we are not humbled, we will be out of control. And we too will erect an image. And actually, you know, it exists in our mind. The Lord is always chipping away at it. Anytime we elevate ourselves above someone else, it is the Holy Spirit saying, seriously? Do you not remember when you used to do the very same thing? And we're either humbled or we're puffed up and we justify, we make excuses. We start looking elsewhere. We look somewhere else. When we are not willing to look right here at what God's telling us, that, the fact that we start looking somewhere else tells us we're in a bad place. When God says, look at this, we need to say, I see it, Lord. It's not a pretty sight. And he says, Letty, this needs to go. Yes, Lord, I see that it needs to go. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was getting ready to have this experience. So he calls everyone together, and he says, when the music sounds, everyone is to bow down. Well, of course, who's going to defy that? Because the consequences is getting thrown into a fiery furnace. Oh, I'll bow to whatever you say, king, I'll do. So everyone bows except three Hebrew young men stand out like a sore thumb, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's see what they have to say in uh, Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. He was furious. Fire up the fire, seven times hotter. Get those men in there. In fact, the fire was so hot, the soldiers that took them in there were, were killed instantly. And Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, they should have been incinerated in that second. But Nebuchadnezzar looks up and he says, Weren't three men put into the fire? I see four. Jump down to verse 25. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. What a sight. He had called everyone together for self-glorification, for a dig me party. And instead, it turned into a dig God party. Because everyone saw this amazing miracle. And instead of this huge golden statue, when they all left and went home, what were they telling about? Not Nebuchadnezzar's grandness, but this great thing that the God of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had done in the, in the burning fire. Well, what else could Nebuchadnezzar say? Verse 28. He says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, and I think this is a safe face thing, therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save in this way. And then he promoted them to bigger and higher jobs. The thing about the carnal nature is that miracles don't really change the carnal heart. We see something and we're, wow, that was great. And then tomorrow, eh, that was yesterday's miracle. That was yesterday's great thing. 
What about today? Well, just like Nebuchadnezzar, with a huge carnal heart, because God had given him so much power, he quickly forgets this great thing that God did. He forgot about the dreams. He forgot about the great miracle that had happened in front of every person that lived in that, in that area. And he started looking at his life again and all that he'd accomplished. His prideful heart was overflowing and God loved Nebuchadnezzar so much. And take note of that and think about this one thing is that God loved Nebuchadnezzar so much he could not let him go the way of pride and arrogance without bringing discipline into his life to get him in line with, with where he needed to be. So he gives him another dream. This dream made him very much afraid. The dream was of a huge and mighty, tall, great tree that was full of leaves and fruit. It was a, an amazing sight. And animals and people came to take refuge under that big tree, and it was awesome. But then here comes an ax and starts cutting at the, at the base. And the tree falls over, and just a little stump is left. And he is so creeped out, and he calls Daniel in to tell him what this is all about. You can only imagine that Daniel was creeped out to have to tell him what the interpretation was. But if you look at um, chapter 4, verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king. This is a decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times or seven years will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone that he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Now look at Daniel's love for the king. Daniel knowing what truth is, Daniel knowing what a relationship with the Lord is, he gives him some advice. He says, O oh, king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. Wow. Daniel's saying, King, repent. It's not too late. If you do what's right, God may not have to do these things. It may be that God changes his mind and you continue. Repent. The word that the carnal heart hates more than anything. If I repent, I have to be humbled. There's no, it doesn't come any other way. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people would humble themselves, number one, nothing else can happen. You can't get to number four, which is repentance, without number one. Repent. Repent means that I acknowledge what God is telling me about me. That I confess the sin that God is bringing into my life. And Daniel's given him some help here. Do what is right and quit oppressing people. You are lording your, yourself over people. You're making people miserable. You're not acknowledging that God has given you everything that you have. You're not some great person that just amassed all of this. Remember, God gives the power for us to even have jobs and do what we do. It, all that we have comes from God's hand. We have to acknowledge that at every turn so that we don't become independent people that are prideful, that build a huge image of ourselves, which is really nothing. Zero. Because then, what the carnal heart does when it erects these huge images that we, then we ourselves want worship. If it sounds weird to you, you're either being conformed to the image of Christ or of Satan. And what in the end will God let Satan have that he wants more than anything? To be worshipped. He's going to get the thing that the carnal heart 
wants more than anything is you bow down to me. Remember, he tried to get that from Jesus in the wilderness. Bow down to me and I'll give you all this. He's going to give him what he wants. If we're becoming like Lucifer, we will be just like that. We have this big imagination of ourselves, an image that nobody sees but us. It exists only in our own mind. Only we see how great we are. No one else sees it, and God says, no, your greatness comes in humility. Humble yourselves, because if we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. We serve a God who loves us so much that he will let us have it the easy way, if we're willing to have it the easy way. If God can say, change this, and we say, yes, Lord, he didn't have to get the two by four out. He can leave it on the ground. He don't have to get the belt out. He didn't have to go and take us to the woodshed. But he loves us so much that if we refuse, well, Nebuchadnezzar had been so full of himself, the woodshed was being prepped. And Daniel gave him fair warning. King, repent. There's a, there's a chance for you not to have to go to this horrible seven-year experience. But you know what happened? And this is our great enemy, time. Time went by and nothing happened. God let it go. Twelve months. Ah, Nebuchadnezzar forgot all about that scary dream. Just like we tend to forget all the things that God tells us when he's bringing us on the carpet and saying, hey, straighten this up. And then we kind of sort of, hmm, 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 hmm. And we just forget that God said straightened up. And then all of a sudden, here he is, verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon that I built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Whoa, you've got to be so bold to say those words after you've been served and noticed by God. But we are the same way. Look at what I've done. Look what I'm going to do. We want accolades. We want to be noticed. We want greatness. We want bigness. And so he got to live like an animal for seven years. Wow. And at the end of seven years... Because that's what it took, seven years. Look at 4, verse 37. After God restored him, it restored his sanity. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. He is the king, I am not. Glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. In other words, what he just did to me was the right thing to do. I deserved it. He gave me fair warning. Everything he does is right. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. What was it all about? Humbling Nebuchadnezzar. God had empowered him to be a leader and he owed God obedience and acknowledgement so for you and I the story of these two kings number one in order to have a relationship with God we have to have humility we cannot have a relationship when we think we're all that much we're better than other people no one here is better than anyone else God is not favor he's not a respecter of persons if you are president of the United States or, you know, if, if you are a trash truck driver, same to God. It does not matter. He notices who you are becoming. And we recognize, number one, in humility, what's so important that we don't recognize otherwise is that we are powerless. We are powerless. We can accomplish nothing without the Lord. The only thing that we can do without God is make a huge mess. And the key to humility is listening to the still, small voice. Are you listening?
listening? Do you know his voice? Are you spending time with the Lord every day to know his voice? In the morning when you get up, are you running late? Are you off to do all of the tasks that you have to do because you have big days and all kinds of stuff to do and I don't have time today. I'll start tomorrow. And tomorrow comes, ooh, the same thing. Gonna be a, it's going to be a rough week. Going to be a rough month. All of a sudden it's a rough year and it's a century has gone by and you've done nothing to spend time with the Lord. So I want to challenge you if you've not started learning to discern the voice of the Lord is to start the day with 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Find a place by yourself. And I want to caution you. Use a paper Bible. Do not use your phone Bible because it's full of traps. Alarms, texts, emails that will distract you in a second. So get your paper Bible out. Find a place in your house where you will not be disturbed. Let the people in your house know, I am going to sit with the Lord. Do not bother me for these 15 minutes. Start with 15 minutes. Talk to the Lord. Let him talk to you. Read the word. Let him speak to you. Let him impress upon you. Learn the voice. Listen to the voice. What in your life can possibly be more beneficial to you than sitting with Christ. Sweet, wonderful friends, if this is not a reality for you, you are living a delusion and you're building an image. You're saying, I don't need you, God. I can start the day without you. And, and Lord, you know I love you. Catch up with me later, okay? I'll, I'll make time with you down the road when I get all my stuff done. It's not okay. It's not okay. Humility cannot be just one day. It, look, what's, look what happened to two kings. And you and I are no different. There's a pharaoh, a king inside of us that wants to rule. And it will have its way. You and I have a pharaoh called the carnal heart. And it wants to have its way. And it will rule us if we do not master it. And if you are not starting your day with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, demonstrating to God, he says, your worship is lip service. You say, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, but I don't see any love. I don't see that you're spending any time with me. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Isn't that awesome? That God sees the wretched creatures that we are with all the good intentions that we don't carry out. But he sees that the desire is there. He sees that we love him. He sees that we wake up in the morning. And what, what starts off as a chore will wind up as what you can't live without. As soon as your eyes open, you start talking to Jesus right there in your bed. If you're a sleepyhead like me, go get your coffee. Take it to your Jesus chair. Wake up, pray, spend time with the Lord. Those 15 minutes will turn into 20 and 30. And then you really have to get a hold of yourself because you'll be late to, late to work every day and that won't be no, no good. But I'm saying you'll want more. And so instead of waking up 30 minutes, you'll start setting your alarm clock to wake up earlier so you can get in your Jesus time before you head out into your day. And I'm not saying that's all you need because, you know, Bible study's got to come in, but morning time is not good for Bible study for most people. You can have Bible study at the end of the day. But I am talking about time where you sit to hear from the Lord. If you are leaving your house, if you are leaving your house without time with Jesus, you are not revealing your love to Christ. You cannot say, I am in a relationship with my Lord, and you never spend time with him. Because he will say to us, I don't know you. We, you never had an interest in me. Why do you want interest in me now? Because you don't want to jump into this blazing fire over here? That's not, fear is not a motivator to the Lord. We don't run to him just from fear. We run to him because we love him. 
So number one is listening to God's voice. He's constantly dealing with the image that we have of ourselves and giving us a realistic image. We are talking in Sabbath school how when we get critical or judgmental or frustrated that God will quickly show us, oh yeah, well you remember how you, you've done the same thing? That's the Holy Spirit's voice saying, mm, 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 don't go there. You're just as wretched as they are. Keep your words in your mouth. Move along. Dispense mercy. Here's, here's what you have to decide. There will be an image in each one of us. Do you want the image of Christ? Because the Bible tells us in Romans 8 and in 2 Corinthians 3 that we are being conformed to the image of Christ. He wants for us to be a perfect reflection of him. He is changing us to be like him. We will either be like him or we will be like his worst enemy. There are only two choices. So dear ones, do you know the voice and is the work that you're doing, is the work that you are doing for God keeping you, keeping God from doing a work in you? Sometimes we get so busy thinking God's given me all of this responsibility and all these wonderful blessings and we're out managing it all. And so we wind up having the work that we're doing that stops God from doing a work in us because we have no time for him. God's not going to chase us around. He doesn't chase us. Hey, hey, come back here. Come sit down with me. I want to talk to you. And each day the Lord watches you walk out and say, you're not going to spend time with me this morning? Are we going to talk? I have some things I wanted to tell you. Will you not sit down for 10 minutes? Am I not worth that with you? So dear ones, listening to the voice, hearing the voice, makes all the difference to you and I. We will listen to a voice, either the voice in our own head. You saw how Saul's voice, his voice became the voice that led him. Nebuchadnezzar went the same way, except the discipline, the harsh discipline that God brought to him, he came to his senses. Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses. And he was restored because he repented and he acknowledged that God is everything and he was nothing. And that God had blessed him with everything. Whoa, what an awesome turnaround from a heathen king. It is so awesome what God can do to someone who is willing. I hope in your life right now, you are not too busy to pray. You are not too busy to spend time in God's word, because one day the call will go out, the bridegroom cometh, and who will have oil in their lamps on that day? God bless you as you seek humility, his face, to pray, and to have a heart that turns so that one day you will see your Jesus face to face. What a glorious day that will be. Amen.